Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, the program dedicated to sharing timely information about the community hospital that's been taking care of Washington Township Healthcare District residents since it opened in 1958. Washington Hospital Today is provided for the sole purpose of informing residents about healthcare topics and issues that have been covered during community forums, free health and wellness classes, or as part of educational sessions held during the district's open board meetings. This program is one more way that Washington Hospital helps empower you, the residents of the district, by providing information needed to make informed decisions about your health. Today's presenters are Vida Reed and Anna Maze. Vida graduated from George Mason University in 1995. She has worked for many years as a research nurse in the area of women's health, heart disease, and diabetes. She became a certified diabetes educator in 2001. She is a member of the American Association of Diabetes Educators and the American Diabetes Association. Vida has been at Washington Hospital since 2006, serving as our Diabetes Program Coordinator. After receiving her Bachelor's of Science degree, Anna attended a dietetic internship at Mercy Hospital in San Diego. Anna started at Washington Hospital in 1986 as an inpatient dietitian. Currently, she is an outpatient dietitian providing education on diabetes and weight management and conducting community lectures. She is certified in weight management from the American Dietetic Association and has also been a certified diabetes educator for more than 10 years. Okay, so let's see, diabetes chat. So tonight we're gonna to talk about a few things. So this one's called fill your plate. What does that make you guys think about when we say fill your plate? It's empty. <laughs> food, huh? <laughs> oh, lots of food. We hear a lot from our patients that they struggle with trying to figure out what to eat. Because even once they learn the information, like how to count carbs and what carbs are, they still struggle with how to put it all together and which ones are good for them. And so we thought we'd put this slide up and we'd let you guys kind of fill your plate. Let's talk about vegetables, right? It's covering half the plate, right? So when you think about vegetables, what kind of vegetables do you guys fill your plates with? Zucchini, it's really growing. It's a it's bumper crop. Season. We, yeah, we got yeah. a bag of zucchini from one of our nice patients yesterday. Mm -hmm. It's so yummy mm -hmm. and pretty. The thing is that zucchini is a non-starchy vegetable. So the intention is for people to fill up half that plate with those non-starchy vegetables because they're not going to disrupt blood sugar like starchy vegetables might. So what are the kinds of vegetables that are not starchy that you could fill half that plate up with? You said zucchini. What else? Green beans? Green beans. Broccoli? Broccoli, of Broccoli. course. The Olympian Broccoli. of vegetables. Cauliflower. Cauliflower. Carrots. Carrots. Uh huh. Cabbage. I love cabbage. Spinach. Or mushrooms are definitely non starchy and very yummy. What'd you say? Somebody said something over here. I missed it. Asparagus. People are using cauliflower a lot more. I mean, I've seen it, you know, it, I've seen it crumbled. It comes in crumbles now. Cauliflower crumbles, roasting the, the cauliflower. Something that's been done for a few years now is making the cauliflowers, the cauliflower cook like a mashed potato. And they're doing rice now, like rice. As, uh, right, like they're that's why like they're doing the crumbles, now. I think. That's yeah. why they're doing the crumbles. But it's um, it's very popular now, cauliflower. Because of Brussels sprouts. You know, everybody, that, there, I've seen so many recipes with Brussels sprouts, and I've heard so many people talking about eating Brussels sprouts that they, that didn't eat them before. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. It's one of those, the, those vegetables, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, even cauliflower, really, those are not the ones people would normally gravitate to. But now I think they're really, part of it, I think, is that a lot of those, are the stores now have things washed and cut up ready to go. And they even have, like, ideas on the back. Because people don't, you know, oh, I gotta wash that, I gotta cut it up. But now it's done for you. So you can, you know, throw it in the pan, follow a few instructions on the back. But uh, Brussels sprouts have become very popular. Asparagus is still expensive. How do you guys?
guys cook your vegetables? How do you cook them, prepare them? She, she eats them raw and steam them. Any other way to cook your vegetables? Mm -hmm. So what, are, what about those vegetable smoothies? How do they... How do they impact the body differently than, say, if you ate them and you chewed them up and everything? How does that work? Well, the, the, it's always better to have it in the whole form because it's going to take more digestion. And whatever will turn into blood sugar is probably going to get into the system more slowly. And if it's when, when, you, when you have fruits or, or vegetables, you know, pureed or made into juices, some of the work is done in terms of digestion. But it, you're, you're less likely to have a rise in blood sugar if it's just a vegetable juice compared to like a fruit juice. If somebody doesn't like any vegetables at all, I'm glad that they're making their own vegetable juice then because it's a good thing to try to get in that, into the system. But, and I, and, and I would say that it's fine to do it if you are, if it does, vegetable juice should not spike the blood sugar if it's made with straight non-starchy vegetables. And what I've seen people tell me that they use the kale, the celery, cucumber then maybe like a uh, an apple like a granny smith apple just to give it a little sweetness i doubt it's going to raise the blood sugar but it's always a good idea to check a couple hours after you have it just to see what it does anybody roasting their vegetables grilling them oh you roast them back there mm -hmm. you put them in the oven so the options for non-starchy vegetables are pretty endless with especially with what's available out there and What's accessible and easy to use, like I said, things are clean, ready to microwave. It's just so many choices to, to encourage people to eat vegetables than it used to be years ago. But what about starchy vegetables? What kinds are those? Potatoes? Yams? Okay, right. Yams, sweet potatoes. Now, there's this whole big, this, this big controversy. Is it a yam or is it a sweet potato? <laughs> you know? But those are considered starchy vegetables but are allowed. Oh, you know, they won't be on the half of that plate, they'd be on the quarter of the plate. So what other starchy vegetables are there besides the potatoes? Beets and carrots are still under non-starchy. Mm -hmm. Usually the pumpkin squash is, star is starchy. Um, butternut is starchy. But um, how about corn? Corn's coming out, right? What do French fries fit in? Is that, you know, is that, I guess it's a start. They're off your plate. That's where they are. <laughs> no French fries on your plate. Okay. Well, this is what I do with the, the potatoes, even the, the sweet yam or the white potatoes. I'll cut them up into like eight pieces, brush them with olive oil, put them in a hot oven, and you know what? They get pretty crisp that way. And again, the test, the true test are kids eating it, and they do eat those. Um, but they get crisp because I'm cutting them kind of thin. Brush them with a lot of olive oil, high temperature, uh, and they get pretty tasty in the oven that way. But those, again, would be on that quarter of the plate, the starchy. Other starchy vegetables, corn, we said, potatoes, what else? So every bean, right? Soybean, pinto, black bean. Yeah, but they're very nutritious. Very nutritious carbohydrate foods. Vegetarians would often challenge with their protein sources because uh, their legumes tend to contribute you know, to the carb. Yeah. They s spill over into the carb portion, the starch portion of your plate, right? They're in your protein and then they spill over into the pro the carb portion. Mm -hmm. So I know that's a real challenge for people who are vegetarians. But what other starches could go there too? What are other starchy things? Outside of vegetables being starchy. Mm -hmm. rice. Brown rice. Mm -hmm. Brown rice, white rice, red rice. Barley. <laughs> Barley's very good. Before we go there, the rice, a lot of times people they ask questions about rice because they're choosing different kinds of rice now. There's all kinds of rice out there now. So what are your guys, you guys' feelings about rice? Brown rice, white rice, red rice, you know, wild rice. Um, there's lots of different ways to get rice. Do you guys believe, brown, you, so you're on the brown rice family, and I know you're in the brown rice family over there. Have you tried rice. quinoa? You tried quinoa? I did. So the more processed the product, typically it's going to contribute. You probably get digested quickly, could spike blood sugars. Quinoa is not as processed. Brown rice, all the, the red rice, black rice is not as processed. You mentioned barley, which is coming into vogue too, to be used in yeah. place of, of um, rice. And barley is gummy like oatmeal, so it has that good kind of fiber to lower cholesterol. 
soups, yes. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've talked a little bit about that starchy part of the plate. We know that that's the part of the food that raises your blood sugars for the most part of the starchy parts of the, of the meal. So you want to be aware of what's on your plate and uh, aware that it contains your blood sugar. It raises it. So, but what about protein? Let's move on to protein and talk about protein sources because there's a lot of talk about, like you were saying, you know, antibiotics in your meats and there's also talk about, you know, giving up meat or choosing other sources for protein. So it's just kind of one of those things that's kind of in flux now. Our, 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 our um, nation is looking at how we eat our food, you know, how we treat our animals. Well, there's Meatless Monday that they try to promote many times. There's a whole website called Meatless Monday. Like Taco Tuesday? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because actually... Fish Friday, yeah. yeah Fish Friday. <laughs> but... Nice um, the, the the key thing is in terms of choices for protein. Of course, if you're going to choose red meat, they should be lean. And uh, fish is really recommended at least two times a week from the Heart Association. So uh, the Heart Association recommends at least two fish meals a week. And then if you have, you know, a poultry a couple of times, maybe you have a vegetarian meal a couple of nights a week. So you're moving away from the beef all the time. Um, and uh, you know, as any some people, it takes a while to warm up to use of tofu or soy products. Anybody try any tofu or soy products? What they've come out recently is that they have infused flavor into them. So then we have to worry a little bit about sodium. But um, the two, the, the, some of the brands I've seen, the sodium wasn't too bad. But it's almost, you can cut it like a piece of meat. And it tastes, some of it has an Asian flavor. Some of them are, more, are savory in a different way, like... I don't know, uh, would maybe go better with Italian food or something like that. But I think that it's, there's so many new products that come out all the time on the market. It's endless. So I think it's interesting to, to be open-minded and try different things. You're not going to like everything, but some things, hey, you know, I can get used to this. This is not too bad. But of course, you do have to read the food label. And we know that the, it's changing too, the food label too. Other kinds of proteins though could go be, um, of course, cheese, but you want to, be careful not to overdo the cheese because it does have um, saturated fat in it, which is a kind of fat that can promote high cholesterol. So, you know, getting light cheese maybe and using it sparingly. So, like, you know, on a, if you have, you can find them grated now, right, and even light or lower fat. And, you know, if you grate it, it can, a little bit goes a long way. Um, and some of the harder cheeses, like the Parmesan Romano, are strong tasting, so... A little surely goes a long way in those cases too. Like on cauliflower, I'll put that at the end or something like that. Or in an egg omelet, I might put a little Parmesan instead of cheddar. So you get a little cheese taste, but not a lot of, of it there. So you want a little to go a long way. Feta tends to be that way too, you know? A little goes a long way um, compared to some other, like a mild cheese like cheddar. You tend to use more of it because it doesn't need, need a lot to get that taste, I think. So, like, sharp is a little stronger. But it's one of those things that um, it's a protein source. It has calcium. It's got protein. So it's a nutritious food, but we got to watch the fat in it. And it's easy to eat a lot of cheese. You don't have to do anything to it, right? Cut it with crackers. It's on hamburgers. It's on tacos. Lasagna, pizza, of course. I mean, I think there's still controversy goes on and on over the years about milk and so many different kinds of products, but it is one of our main sources of calcium and vitamin D. Yeah. Um, and I think your, your, your needs change over, your needs for calcium and different nutrients change throughout the life cycle. So it's important to maybe touch base with how much am I supposed to be really having. Maybe I don't need as much as I used to. Um, there's a website called Choose, um, it's called Choose My Plate, and that's where this kind of comes from, that talks about portions that people need to, to meet their daily requirements. The concern with, with I have with people drinking whole milk, it, well, it always looks at a pattern of your diet. You have to look at, it's not one food that's going to um, be, be all the, the thing you need the most. And no one food has everything you need. But let me go back to the whole milk. If somebody has one glass of whole milk a day, that's fine. But if you start drinking that often throughout the day, the calories alone could add up and may contribute to weight gain because it is a whole milk, whole fat product, okay? 
it all, I, always, I always look at how much somebody's doing something throughout the week, throughout the day, to get an idea of the pattern of their eating. I mean, if somebody just has one glass of whole milk a day, that, that's, that's probably fine. It's almost scary to have anything nowadays. Everything I know, you hear too. Just come up doing something. Well, that's a problem when you have these little bits of it. What happens is that the news, the media takes a study that was done and will amplify the little findings that were found. And it makes news, but there's not enough information to really make from one study to make a general recommendation about what do we do next. You know, and some well, some research is not good. Some studies are not good, but they still take some bits of information from it to make headlines. So it's all about making headlines a lot of the time. The dairy milk, cow's milk, does have calcium. It has protein. Uh, vitamin D is added. But also you will find now other milks fortified, like the soy milk has uh, protein in it too, that naturally from the soybeans it's made from, but now they're fortified with more calcium and vitamin D for people who might be lactose intolerant. So you can get the same nutrients by choosing those other things. The almond milk and some of the, the nut milks don't have the protein that the cow's milk or soybean milk will have. But they, they, do, they do fortify them now with D and calcium, but they're not as high in protein. And they are, those are lower in carbohydrate too than the dairy, than the cow or soybean. So exercise, ah, that just popped up behind us, huh? It's always chasing me down. <laughs> exercise. So why do you think we included this slide here? Why is exercise important for us? Burn the calories. Burn the calories. Okay, what else? And the car burn the carbs and the calories. Yeah, respiratory system, right? Blood circulation, Blood circulation um, heart health. Uh, what is that? Are those happy endorphins that are released? Mental health. Mental health. Mental Bone health. health. Bone density. Bone health. Density. Bone health. So exercise has a lot of benefits, right? So it's not just for diabetes control. It has other benefits, too. I always think, you know, if I'm going to run and catch the bus, I want to make sure my heart's ready. You know, I don't want to test it out on trying to catch the bus <laughs> or catch the BART train. I want to make sure my heart's ready and exercise up. Because <laughs> people have those heart attacks when they go to shovel the snow, you know. They uh, haven't done any exercise in a while, and they go out to shovel snow, and they have heart attacks. I'm sorry. The weekend warrior syndrome. The weekend warrior syndrome. Yeah. And you guys on the West Coast, I used to live on the East Coast, so you hear about that a lot. People going out to shovel snow, they were otherwise healthy, and they fell dead of a heart attack in the snow because they exerted all that new energy that they hadn't been using. So exercise is important. Who's exercising? Anybody exercising? Yes. Oh, good. Good. Yes. Yeah. You're checking your steps for the day, I'm Anna? checking my steps Anna's for the day. checking her steps for the day. I don't have you know, good steps today. Most of your phones will track your steps. You don't have to do anything to it. It has a free program on your cell phone, and it tracks your steps. No, you don't need anything. You just have to have it with you. If, you're not, if it's not in your pocket or on you, it can't track you. And that's the neatness about the other things, like Fitbit, because you attach them to your body. I don't have good steps today. You don't have good steps today? No, I don't. Yeah. What's your goal? Well, good the question. goal should be like, I mean, I'm trying to go for 10,000 steps a day. Okay, well, what I did was my, my niece had a Fitbit, and I had this, and we were walking and to see if how accurate this was. This gave me 300 more steps than her Fitbit did. So, but it's a good idea. I mean, it's a it's just a good uh, technique, I think, or challenge for yourself to try and and then she's competing with other people on her on her phone. Too. Fitbit challenges, yeah. yeah. My Fitbit uh, monitor now. I'm not wearing it today. The battery died, but um, it tells me um, how many inactive hours I've had. Like if I haven't been active. At the end of the day, it says for you know five out of the nine hours today you were inactive, meaning I didn't get at least 200 steps an hour just sitting at my desk. So I think that's a pretty good one. I should get up and talk. Me. I'm going to pacing back and forth. I know. Look at it. She's going up. It's going she's up. She's holding that thing in her hand. <laughs> Start dancing. Okay. Oh. Well, this, they recommend that you get, in terms of exercise, about 30 minutes of moderate activity a day is what the recommendation is. But there's also another recommendation, too, that 
about every 45 minutes or so, you should get up and move around at your desk. At least once within that hour, you should move around at your desk. That's what uh, you should get up right now. Everybody, you should stand uh, up. Okay, everybody's up. Step, everybody's up. This is too a little up, bit. Up, up, up. This is what they recommend you do. Is yeah. like every hour or so, about every forty-five minutes, you get up and do something. Go to the water cooler and gossip for a while, or you know, <laughs> go check the mail. Or because what's you know. sitting is new, the new smoking now. I mean, we've we've gotten people to get rid of smoking, and now we've got to get rid of sitting. And so I know a lot of people who have will have uh, like a podium desk. I've had a lot of patients tell me that lately. So exercise is important, not just for lowering your blood sugars, but also for all the other reasons that you guys mentioned why it's important. And it, so there's another recommendation with exercise, getting 10,000 steps a day. That's another recommendation. So there's a lot of things that they recommend you do. You can pick or choose one of them and do something to get moving a little bit more, right? We can all stand and do that. They say uh, with, with, the, with stairs, you take one flight up and two flights down. It's kind of a rule of thumb for the stairs. Park a little farther from the grocery store. What are some other ways you can sneak in Bring the cart back. steps? Bring your cart back. <laughs> so you don't hit her car. That's a public announcement for me, <laughs> is yeah. to bring the cart back. Yeah, all those little things we have to do because technology has taken away a lot of the little things we used to do. And outside, that, that's in, and still include the scheduled exercise that we talk about, too, for all those, that list of health benefits that we were talking about earlier. But it doesn't really take that much to lower blood sugar. Just walking maybe 20 minutes after you eat a meal helps to lower that blood sugar. Uh, so you may not get the weight loss that you wanted from it, but you're going to get blood sugar lowering. And if somebody starts to really do that more often, their med medications might need to be adjusted because they're going to get a blood sugar lowering effect. So mm, monitoring, monitoring. What are you guys monitoring for good health? What do you monitor? You watch your diet, monitor your diet. That's a good thing to monitor. Monitor what you put in, right? It's a good thing. Sometimes people will write food records to kind yeah. of track if the weight fluctuations, they might write down what they're eating. So that's even more detailed monitoring. And now you've got apps that help you do that too, you know. On your phone. Or you can take pictures of your food too. We had somebody do that and it was excellent. It really helped to evaluate what they were eating. I'm going to push that more is to really take photos. I mean, if you're going to take, spend time take taking selfies, selfie. take it of your food. So when you go into your doctor, the doctor says, you're not doing enough. He says, listen, look at here. I've been eating these. This is my food. This is what I eat, doctor. I'm doing a good job here. So you have to have plates of vegetables. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so monitoring what you put into your body, your food intake. That's a good thing. What else do you guys monitor? You monitor your blood pressure. Very good. A lot of times patients come in to get their blood pressure checked and they say, oh, it's, it's always low when I'm at home. And that's why the doctors will say, keep a record and bring it in with you because I want to make sure I see that it's always low when you're at home. Or, or sometimes patients will say, you'll take their blood pressure and they'll say, well, I missed my medicine this morning. So, and the blood pressure will be like, you know, 190 over 110. And they missed their medication that morning and I'm ready to send them to the ER because that's where I would go if my blood pressure was that high. So... It's really important to, to monitor it. They have those monitors like at Walmart or at Walgreens at the drugstores. I mean, they're not perfect, but it's a, it gives you a general idea of how you're doing if you don't buy one at home to monitor your blood pressure with. And you can buy them at home. They can range in price from like 30 bucks to 179 bucks. You know, so you can buy those blood pressure monitors. And even this that phone there, it doesn't do blood pressure, but it does do heart rate. You put your finger on it, I think it does your heart rate. I don't even, I think it might do blood pressure too. There's a heart rate one right here. Is there a blood pressure one there's on there? There's a stress one there too. Oh, there's a stress <laughs> one, okay. We have the same phone. That's right. What else does it check? Oh, yeah, let's see, manage. It, it'll manage, it'll, 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 tra it'll monitor your sleep yeah. too. It mm -hmm. monitors your sleep. Mm -hmm. So they do all kinds of things that technology does. So blood pressure is something that you guys are monitoring. What else are you monitoring? Anybody else? Blood sugar. Blood sugar yeah. yeah, blood sugar. What's the, what's the fasting blood sugar target? When you wake up in the morning, what should it be? Uh, less than 130, 80 to 130. That's very good. Very good. Some some organizations say less than 120. Normal's less than 100. 
and for it's acceptable. When well, non-diabetes. Non-diabetes. Non We're all normal. normal. <laughs> Less than a, less than a hundred if you don't have diabetes when you wake up in the morning. Yes. So monitoring your weight. And what else do you? If you if you're you know as you get older you gotta monitor your height. <laughs> you start shrinking. <laughs> oh no. So those are some of the things that you should monitor, right? So let's see what else we got here. What's next? Oh, pills, 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 and more pills. Medications. So. There's some studies that, that suggest that um, doctors delay starting medication on patients because patients don't want to start medication and they delay it a little bit for them because they work for you after all. And if you say you don't want to take medicine, they're not going to force it on you. So if you do take medicine, it's really important to know how your medication works. Uh, it's important to know the side effects that your medication might have, the expected side effects from your medication and also it's important to know when you should take them like for example the cholesterol medications they typically recommend you take at night and it's because it works with the natural rhythm of the body mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what is that can you explain that a little bit the, um, well the metabolism of cholesterol is usually in the e a lot of things go on your body while you're sleeping mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that the body's doing in terms of just recovery during the day from the day and so cholesterol metabolism is probably highest in the evening. And so it is suggested to take like Lipitor or those statin medications at night. Take them at night. So medications have to be taken at a certain time. A lot of times to kind of work with your body, what your body is doing naturally, right? Because medications are designed to mimic what the body does naturally that it either no longer can do or you need a little bit of help with it, right? So it's good to know when you should take your medications timing-wise, before meals, after meals, at night, in the morning, uh, that kind of thing. It makes a big difference. I've, we've had patients who, when they just start taking the medications correctly, it's made a huge difference in their blood sugars. And all this time they were taking it wrong. And then, But what happens is when you go to the doctor and the blood sugar still is not in the range that they want it to be, they'll just increase the dose, but he just keeps taking it wrong. and so. It's important to really get the directions, you know, correct directions. You should talk to the doctor about it, talk to diabetes educators for a medica other medications, you know, talk to the pharmacist. Usually when you go to the pharmacy, they say, do you need to talk to the pharmacist about sign here if you don't want to talk to them? I always get the phone, they won't talk to me. <laughs> when they say that, do, do you need to talk to the pharmacist? And they're walking away. I'm like, no, I'm okay, I'm good. I know that medicine. <laughs> yes. But that's a good time because they'll bring up, I think, the important points of it. Because there's drug interactions too with other drugs and medica and food. There's drug food interactions too. And vitamins and minerals can interact with drugs. Timing is important too when you take your medication. Like let's say you take it every morning, but is it every morning at 7, every morning, you know, and then some mornings at 8 and some mornings at 10. It's still morning after all, right? But it's really important to take it about the same time every day. You know, if you take it at 7 in the morning, you should always try to take it at 7 in the morning. If you take it twice a day, again, the space, every 12 hours, you want to make sure that spacing is really good when you're taking the medicine and paying attention to those kinds of things with your medication. I've had one patient told me, oh, if I take the medicine, it's going to make my body lazy and my body won't do. The medicines are not stopping your body from doing what it would naturally do. You know, your body's still going to do that. The medicine is just enhancing whatever that effect is that you need to have your blood sugars or your blood pressure or your cholesterol be controlled. It's not going to impede what your body's already doing. You know, one of the things, uh, like your, your pancreas makes insulin. So if you start injecting insulin, it's not going to make your pancreas stop making any insulin that it has to make. It's like if you if you need more insulin, it's because your pancreas can't make it, right? So, but if your pancreas is making some insulin and you're taking insulin, you might need less insulin. It just depends. Uh, that's a myth. It's it's a myth. What happens is. is that the, uh, some do we want to um, preserve the pancreas function. So by not making it work harder than it needs to, you can preserve the beta cells or the cells that make insulin. Okay, so 
by keeping, you know, weight in a healthy body weight range, by keeping active, all these things help the, the pancreas work less. Some people take metformin, uh, which helps the liver not make so much blood sugar. That's going to help the pancreas not work as hard as it should, too, to manage blood sugars from its own body production. So there's all these different angles to help preserve that pancreas function. And sometimes the doctors do want people to take the medicine early on to preserve the health of the pancreas. And it lasts longer. And sometimes, too, you know, when you uh, start medication and you have other areas in your life, like lifestyle modifications that you can make, like adding more exercise and changing your diet, the medication that you start, you might very well come off of it because you've implemented these other changes that are, 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 that are going to be beneficial. But then you might have someone who is already exercising, already at a healthy weight, and they have diabetes or prediabetes, and they can't add any more exercise to have an impact. And so that person just might need medication right from there. But there is, an, uh, there is the possibility that there is much change to be made with lifestyle modification. And once you start to make those changes, then you might come off of some of the medicine. But it's, 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 it's always, I think, a good idea if the doctor recommends that you go on something to you know, give it a try and, and then start to implement your changes. The lifestyle changes might take quite some time for to people, kick to, in. people to do something. You know? They're not going to make changes overnight, typically, typically. So what they can do is maybe take that medication that's suggested for the, during the time they're trying to make these changes so that the body's not exposed to all that high blood sugar and the pancreas isn't working so hard. So, because yeah, we do worry about how high your blood sugar goes and how long it stays high, right? So those are some of the things we worry about. So we don't want to be risk takers with diabetes, right? In our health, we don't want to be risk takers. So some of the things you can do to reduce your risk, because what we worry about when your diabetes is uncontrolled is the complications that can happen when diabetes is poorly managed. That's what we really worry about because, you know, most people who have type 2 diabetes, they don't get a blood sugar of 500 and croak over, right? They have persistent elevations of their blood sugars and they have a heart attack. And then they suffer from the residuals of the heart attack or they have a stroke and they suffer from the residuals of the stroke. So those kinds of things happen when diabetes is uncontrolled. But controlled diabetes doesn't cause any of that stuff. And how do you control diabetes? diet, exercise, medication if it's needed. So when you control it, you don't have to worry about these risks. What I'm saying, when your blood sugar is persistently elevated, it puts you at risk for things like stroke and heart attack. And that's that number we look at called the A1C. It's really a predictor of your risk for complications. It's not, I mean, we talk about it being assessing your control, but it's really a predictor of your risk, and that's how doctors see it. When they look at the A1C, as the A1C goes up, your risk for something bad happening increases. As your A1C comes down, your risk for something bad happens actually decreases, regardless of what your previous uh, control was. As your A1C improves and comes down, it reduces your risk for something bad happening. So and there are, are studies that have done that have proven that. So what are some of the risks? What are the, some of the complications of poorly controlled diabetes? Do you know? So because of that, you want to do surveillance, right? You want to do assessments of, you know, how, how are my eyes doing? What do my eyes look like when, I, you know, when my diabetes is well controlled, getting a baseline on what your vision is? and then seeing a di an eye specialist once a year mm -hmm. to reassess that. Because a lot of times when they catch things early, they can do a lot more to fix it as opposed to waiting till later. Mm -hmm. You know, When you see your doctor every three months, part of what they're doing is they're doing blood tests to check you. They're not checking to see if the medicine is damaging you. They're checking to see how your body is doing. As we get older, our body function slows down naturally and normally. And you can have a problem that's completely unrelated to diabetes that might affect the liver or the kidneys, and they have to process medications. So it's really important for your doctors to keep a good eye on your, your functioning, your, your body functioning, your kidney function, your liver function, your heart function, and all those things to make sure that it's healthy for you to continue on certain medications, to make sure that your body isn't deteriorating as a result of diabetes if it's uncontrolled. So the eye exam, comprehensive eye exam, mm -hmm. every year, 
having your feet checked every time you see the doctor, you know, seeing the dentist every six months, all those things are part of, of con continuous health and maintenance. And look for cavities and stuff. The, the, the gums are very vascular, they have a lot of blood vessels there, so if the sugars are high, then that sugar is getting into your, 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 your teeth and it can cause cavities. And so cavities, there is some, some connection between cavities and heart disease too. So it's really important to have good teeth health, mouth health to uh, assess, you know, so that you protect your heart too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Problem solving, putting the pieces together, making it all work. Yeah. Part, part yeah. of problem solving is really digging deep and planning. Right. Getting, getting the groceries you need. Yeah. Um, trying to, I mean, it's not going to be a hundred, you're not going to be all on, on, on target all the time, but most of the time, if you've got the things you need, you're more likely to uh, plan better. Sometimes people will go to the pharmacy and the pharmacist says, oh, that copay is going to be $70. And they say, well, I'll see you later. They leave it there. <laughs> and they're not going to see their doctor for like three months and they don't take it. So problem solving is communicating that to the doctor. There may be a cheaper version of that medicine that you could take. You know, when you run out of a medicine, you want to call your doctor and get a refills and reschedule your appointments and those kinds of things. And, you know, having resources that you can rely on to ask questions of if you, if you have a question. Mm -hmm. There are lots of resources with the Internet now and uh, so much information is out there that you can go to to get answers for. And that's really a big part of diabetes education. It's not so much that you have all the answers, but having a place to go to get the answers if you need them. Because your answers will change depending, you know, as more science comes out. Uh, you know, you're going to have more questions and, and the answers might change later on. You find out things through science and research, you know. That's how medicine is. Mm -hmm. That's how we've arrived where we are now with diabetes management. You know, there's trial and error and, and people who work long hours studying and medications and uh, you know, doing research. So, other problem solving would be, for example, going back to monitoring when you look at trends in blood sugar. You know, you're monitoring your blood sugar and you see that in the morning it's always pretty good, it's the 120, and then all of a sudden you notice, hmm, nothing's changed, but I'm seeing it starting to go up. What's been happening? And is that going to change? How long is that going on? Is that something that's not changeable or is it back, going back to your lifestyle? Hmm, well, let's see, I've been having some, uh, late nights and I notice I've been eating later or more stress, maybe you're coming down with a cold. If it doesn't resolve, nothing else has changed. Maybe you need a medication adjustment. So it's, that's what monitoring helps you do the problem solving. Yeah. The next thing is stress. I think that that's a problem that's hard to solve a lot of the time because it's hard to know how it's really affecting you. Physical and emotional stress. And I think that in today's society there is a lot of it and and so people might have um, I think appropriate coping skills and sometimes people don't have appropriate tools. And sometimes you have it on Monday but not on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys do to cope uh, with not just stress but you know life in general things that are happening how do you guys what do you guys do to cope? I watch the, like like late night shows have like little comedy skits on yeah. YouTube, just to take your mind off of something for a bit. Yeah, yeah. I always feel real special when I get my hair done. I just I just feel rich yeah. <laughs> when I'm sitting in the salon, you know, getting my hair done, thinking what a waste. I get of my sleepy. Money. <laughs> I get sleepy with the massage in my head. Yeah. But to, talking to somebody, you know. Yeah. You talk to the hairdresser. Yeah. <laughs> You're like a bartender if you're there so long getting your hair done. <laughs> but talking to people, I think, is really a valuable way to cope with something. Yeah. There's people who have to talk to a lot of people <laughs> to help cope with their problems. But there's um, some people who think, well, nobody wants to hear about my problems. I'm not gonna talk about them. But you know, somebody does want to hear. You should talk about it. You just gotta find that somebody who wants to hear about it. Good listener. Or right, sometimes people need a counselor because they're going through something where it demands uh, somebody who their scope of practice is to really help to give you guidelines and tools that other people might not think of that will help you. Um, so 
sometimes I think counselors are very valuable to have. I think that everyone who has diabetes should have at least a once a year counseling session with the therapist just to talk about all of the things and the challenges that you face because they're very different, you know, than it's like, you know, the person who runs the, 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 the 400 sprint and the person who runs the 400 sprint but has to jump over hurdles at the same time. You guys are jumping over hurdles, you know. And sometimes it's just really good to have somebody to just sit down with you and just kind of talk about that process. How are you managing it? How are you handling it? What are some of your challenges? Helping you to, to process it. And I think, you know, it's really healthy when you have a chronic illness to have a, a, a mental health professional just sit down with you and you sit down with them and just, you know, hey, I'm handling things well. I'm doing great. I got get great coping skills. And they can say, well, good. You're doing pretty good or make suggestions for you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the recommendations that we've talked about here are all these different slides that came up are really for everybody should be eating better exercising, monitoring their weight, and, and for, good, for good help. But when you have the, a condition that really is depending on those things, it, 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 it makes it a little bit more stressful for you. I think it's also a good idea to really talk to the doctor. Come in, when you see the doctor, bring information to them and talk to them about what the goals are. How is my health? Let's look at those labs. Can you sit down and just talk to me about it? And because I think people need reassurance, like, okay, Maybe you don't have to be here, you know, have this A1C, like I was saying, some of these neat goals can be adjusted. You know, some people are so stressed out about not meeting a certain blood sugar that they're supposed to have. But the doctors are going to say, you know, it's okay, everything looks good here, and that you have peace of mind. And that even helps reduce the stress, I think. So, well, that wraps up our program for us tonight. Thank you all so much for coming.